us now to sit here and debate the theory of the Obviously, our industry is having an impact on it.
Yeah, it was fun. Yeah, it was interesting. Is it by the way? Is it T? I'm gonna, I'm gonna write his name one time with like an accent over his name. I always thought because he's got the brightest shirt. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
disease uh, foundation. When we have our Ramadan memorial in September is when we present the check. This, this coming September, typically we'll follow the executive board meeting, which is on the 20th. But that day, the angels are not in town. So we're going to move it to a Friday. That way you guys can get out, uh, buy as many hot dogs and flat beers as you can consume, and they'll be okay because we'll have the next day to recover. We're going to send out an e-poll. There's two options. We'll either do it on the 16th when they play Seattle, or the 30th when they play Texas. So we'll send out a poll for all the members. Uh, it'll be our first meeting back from the break over the summer. Please show up. Uh, we're, we're trying to do as much as we can. I'm going to give you guys a little tip tonight. I just told Rita that we want to give away a lot of money tonight. You know, I saw the registration of the town a little bit. So we're blasting this out to the universe afterwards. And to all you that are not here, no chance to get any kind of money. So all you who are here, your odds are very, very, very good. Okay. That takes care of all our business. Our guest speaker tonight is Paul Dory. He is an AIA, IFA fellow and a DSCC fellow. And he's a chairman. He's the chairman and CEO of the Digi Group. And he's globally renowned and award winning architect. He's one of the world's most sought after thought leaders, strategists, and integrators in the process, technology, and business. He's been seen on Bloomberg and NBC TV and all that and news we're introducing. This is part of our continuing series on how technology is affecting our construction industry. We want to be ahead of the same and talk about it with all of you. How it relates to how technology will affect you in the field, how it will affect you in your offices, and how it's going to be an integral part of construction going forward. So stay with us through all this. Uh, again, thank you all for your participation. And without any further ado, I want to turn it over to Paul and give him a big round of applause. Technology really, really, really early on. And I always had this notion, especially since I can pull 
you know, the mini main frame off together. I needed to set it back up because I had to learn how to design it so that I could showcase it, right, in, in, my, in these trade shows. I was always wondering why are the computer manufacturers making all this money? Because all the computer factories were doing was taking other equipment manufacturers' stuff, pushing it all together, and then putting the IBM or the Dell or the compact computer sign on it. I said, why can't all this stuff be in the walls, floors, and ceilings of buildings? A building is computer. Right? Well, it's taken this long that I think we're there. So when you hear the term smart cities, it's not so much just some smart buildings and things like that. What we do is that we actually master plan from the human-centric standpoint, meaning that on staff, the first person that I go to um, when we design anything uh, is our cultural anthropologist. Learn about the people, because everything you're gonna see here, it's not like save as and all of a sudden you're gonna get like, you know, a city or a building. That's not what this is about. It's about a process, about who, who are we designing these things for? And I think that that's a really important thing that I think you guys should be very proud of, especially at, at, you know, as the trades, right? Because what you do is you actually do it. You build it. And it's a very noble cause, because to be a human being on this planet, we need water, fresh water, right? We need safe food, and we need shelter. That's the main thing. If we don't have that, we, as a species, go away, right? So I really, you know, if you can take anything from this, is that everything you see here is tech, but its origins come from a human-centric standpoint. Maybe data-driven, as you'll see, but it's human-centric. So that's why we're getting all this notoriety out in the press, which is a good thing. Uh, we do have a very interesting global footprint. It's been very challenging the past 24 months, obviously, right? uh, because we had so many projects in China, it was, it was crazy, because of the way that we brought innovation over there in order to create a better environment, and also a little bit of diplomacy there, too, right? Well, good luck with that now, right? You know, the whole world's turned upside down. So we had a pivot, and what you're going to see here is two areas that, that we've made a huge growth, and that's in the Middle East, right here in the USA. I never thought that I'd be working here, right? Because of, well, the authorities have a jurisdiction, quite frankly, right? Getting anything innovative in there. And we have too many damn lawyers. Sorry, but what we do, right? So any sort of innovation, if it goes sideways, you're gonna get sued. Who the hell wants to work in that environment, right? I, you know, it was kind of fun working in China, right? Because, you know, if something goes sideways, they just look the other way. <laughs> it's brilliant, you know? But at the end of the day, we really have to have these these big ideas, put them into context, right? So the way that we work is that we work with government officials because a lot of these cities are massive. Our largest project right now, which is still operational, is actually about 60 kilometers south of Beijing, uh, and it was non-existent four years ago. Uh, with the, at the end of this year, there'll be 12 million people living and working there. Wow, right? So these are massive things that we have to be very careful about how we categorize things, how we, it's called a taxonomy, how do we put these things into order? So we came up with these smart cities principles that every urban environment is gonna need something like that. Now here's the cool part. You don't go say that. So what works in Anaheim is not gonna work up in Santa Barbara, right? Because there's different needs. So what we do is we just create these categories and then we create a different stack or, or we, we prioritize them differently. And then we put different innovations behind it. The analogy is, Innovations to us are like ingredients to a chef, and we have to come up with different recipes every single time. So a lot of the things that you're gonna see here are based upon that, but in order to actually have politicians actually understand what we do in our industry, we have to come up with two big pieces here. And one was everything we do is measured against what's called the Sustainable Development Goals. Now, some of this stuff is kind of, how do you do that like with a building or, or a street or a neighborhood? But we do our best to give these 17 different goals. And then all of a sudden the politicians get to go, oh, so now we can say that we're smart or we're sustainable. I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, you know who you're marketing, that's fine. But the thing that we're finding really interesting is watching, especially the bigger firms inside of our industry, the building product manufacturers, right? The Armstrongs, the, you know, Georgia Pacific, groups like that. Up until COVID, it was always about earnings. Right? and the stock would be rewarded if you had a good quarter. Well, there's this whole new wave of thinking that has just been shocking over the past 24 or 30 months, where this thing about what's called environment, social, and governance, or ESGs, are now just as important, if not more important, than earnings. Mind-boggling, because now that totally upsets the apple cart of public trade companies, which directly affects everything you guys do. Everything. Because the Fortune 500 companies are the ones that are driving everything 
So just keep in mind the ESGs because I can then talk about this really interesting world of blockchain and why that's going to be such an important piece for everything that we do in our industry, starting with the AIA, the American Center for Architects National Convention that's happening, in fact, uh, I believe next month in Chicago. I'll show you a slide on that in a second. But these are the scale of projects we do. This is a generous sort of way. Uh, that's a one kilometer tall tower. Um, one kilometer tall, that's, uh, that's uh, three Empire State buildings. And, the, and this was built uh, for Evo. There's no reason why God's going to that this thing needs to be built, but they did. And we designed the entire city around the border to feed and support it. Uh, the sway factor up on top, just so you know, is four feet. Four feet. So at any one time, you're, you're going four feet. So what we have to do is we have the counterbalances in there, which is a very, very thin piece of water, and it acts like a ballast. So it's constantly going like this, so you don't feel it, but the actual thing is still moving four feet. Wild, wild projects, right? Um, and what, this, what, what these projects have taught me um, is that sometimes things happen at a very humble level that explode when you don't understand what scale is. So back in 1997, I got introduced to this group in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts, that had this idea of called 3D parametric CAD. That was a very fancy term for saying they were designing it 3D on the computer. How cool, right? Now CAD was something that you know, I was really good at, and I thought this was really intriguing because you would show who the real designers were and who they weren't. Because do you know that there's a lot of designers out there that don't design in 3D? <laughs> you guys have walls and ceilings, I'm sure you can like, like name about a half a dozen off the top of your head, right? Looks really good in plan, but 3D just escapes them. But they're licensed. I don't know how that happens. I'm working on it. But what we did was, in 1997, this group brought this technology over from the UK. Um, and they were positioning it for engineers, which is where it should be. Well, <clears throat> I joined them because they wanted to take a look at the architectural profession. So, and I had some friends in there uh, that ran IT uh, in big firms, in BBJ, SOM, EIEIO, all those big firms. And what we did was, we were named Charles River Software. We brought in a new CEO, and he renamed us Revit. And on $800,000 worth of sales, we scared one of this so much that they brought us for $133 million. That was a really good day. I said, screw architecture. <laughs> this, you know, software is where it's at. So yeah, this ushered in this whole idea of building information modeling, which I'm going to show why that's so important and why the trades are going to have such an important piece in this. Uh, I've been working now for the past six years with, uh, with the Mechanical Contractors Association, dealing with them, and it's been remarkable to watch how those team knockers are really starting to take control, and actually they're better at doing the 3D work than the actual designers themselves. So really, really important stuff. So, some other background, which I think is appropriate here. Uh, also in 1997, um, I wrote a book on how to use the internet for our industry. <clears throat> and it was called Cyber Places, uh, only because I didn't know the term metaverse. Um, that came out five years earlier. I just never read the book, it was, um, which was called Snow Crash, where that term came around. So the reason why we wrote Cyber Place was because cyberspace was what everyone was talking about. It was AOL, a copy serve, a little bit of the web. But, but 97 was an important time because there was this new technology called VRML uh, that could create a markup language to view things in 3D. So we worked with the San Francisco Giants on their brand new stadium back in the day through Planet Nine Studios. And, this, and these are the screenshots from my book in 1997 showing the virtual worlds, not cyberspaces, but cyber places, a place that has a destination. So we've been at this game a long time. So when you hear the term metaverse, I'm like, <laughs> welcome to the party. These things are really important because they're going to show, number one, how work gets done better, simulations, things like that. Uh, working with um, a number of LA uh, drywall contractors, uh, we have, would have a very cool technology based upon the, uh, the HoloLens by Microsoft, which is defunct right now, but they're morphing it into a virtual reality world, where <clears throat> there was a, there was a uh, we, we did this test that had a seasoned uh, super, right, and his, and his crew, and we separated the crew from the super, so only one guy was not given one piece of tape, uh, you know, me measuring tape, not, not one level. All he did was he put on the goggles, and then he was able to place the track, being able to place where everything needed to be. And he did it not only 40% faster, but it was 100% accurate, rather than the traditional way of putting together an internal bathroom is what we had. 
So that's just one case study of what we're starting to see. Things that look cool, but how do you put them into practice, both for design, construction, and then most importantly, what do you do with that digital asset after you deliver your work? Now, this is where uh, you know, we get some interesting terms. So I'm going to try and defunct a lot of these terms that you have here. They call like digital twin. Right? A, a digital twin would be a drawing. Right? It's a representation digitally of what is in the, the, the world of reality. <clears throat> and this term digital twin really comes from this concept that every footprint now leaves a cloud print. No matter what you do, no matter where you go, even if you use things like Fitbit right, and, and other things just in your daily lifestyle, we are capturing such vast amounts of data about ourselves that we are creating digital twins about ourselves as well. Right? What we do with that now becomes the important point. Um, in the case of Neon, we did a very interesting uh, thing here. Uh, Neon is a brand new country being carved out of Saudi Arabia to be an example to the Saudi Arabian citizens that this is what Saudi Arabia could be if we stop listening to the 400 year old clerics. And this idea of Neon was to create, and it is being created, this, th this fantastical world. So we were brought in to take a look at the healthcare because that's one of the smart city pieces. And we were told, listen, we really like the hub and spoke system of healthcare in the US meaning the hospital and then the regional metro clinics, right, feeding that. And we said, hold on, wouldn't it be really interesting if we could make the person the hub and medical services be the spokes and allow people that are healthy to live a healthier lifestyle, spend the money on the wellness part of the well-being rather than just spending all of our money on sick people. We still spend that same money in acute instances of the chronic. That doesn't go away, but our focus should be on creating healthy environments. And I think everyone can agree after this uh, COVID thing, man, I'm taking a look at interior air a lot differently than I used to, right? The idea of, are we creating the problem before it's there? Because we know now that we're in the age of the pandemic, right? And there'll just be more and more things, and we're, and we're all living with it, and least some of us have, haven't made it, but we're gonna continuously learn. But I think we're aware now. So when we start talking about this idea of wellness, we're also talking about lifestyle. So, and here's a for instance. In all of our designs, we make sure that from where a person gets up in the morning to where they have to go to work or, or, or go to play or learn and then have their day and then come back home, that we can build in 10,000 steps. Right? That's the measure like in which you go 10,000 steps a day. Right? Well, we can actually design that and people don't realize that. And those are the special things that we're still continuously to learn about what this wellness environment can be like. So, with that in mind, there's also other terms that are absolutely being misused. And I just want to, again, just to fund what this stuff means. So, a metaverse is really a system of systems, okay? Think of the metaverse as outer space. We know outer space is there, but there's no there there, right? It's cyberspace, it's, but it has an environment. So we hear the metaverse, that's all it is, it's outer space. But in outer space, we have constellations, we have solar systems, we have planets, galaxies. Those are the things that when you start hearing people saying, oh, you know, I want to have a virtual world there because I want to be in the metaverse, that's what that means. So there's outer space, there's planets, and then there's digital twins. That's the pecking order that we're starting to take a look at what it means then to have a level of engagement or a level of experience. And this is where things start to get fun. Right? Because part of this background, especially the digital twin, has some real reality to it. Right? Um, a lot of digital twins are being used uh, for performance in industrial and factory settings, really important. So think of it like a mirror. It's an exact mirror about what's in reality. The other piece is, well, here in your manufacturing, is this, is this connection between the physical and the digital. I think this is a really important point. You guys have to deal with, with reading digital information all day long for the work done, right? But at the end of the day, there's going to be this, this crossover from the physical to the digital. And like I mentioned with the uh, drywall co contract up in LA that, that still works with uh, you know, putting on uh, you know, goggles in order to better their performance. Um, that's, that, that's the quick wins. Those are going to be the, the step-by-steps that we're starting to see out in the field, that people are starting to go, huh, a different way of working. A side benefit of all that, when you start to use tools like that and, and show that there's a real uh, 
uh, you know, lowering of the amount of time, a higher quality incidents, uh, you know, all of those different uh, you know, measures that, that we can all say in business is really important. It's capturing the minds of the kids, right? Because I have an 11-year-old son, right? He, he went through the entire stair system. The stair system starts with Minecraft. They're all get into Minecraft, and they're building digital worlds and all this stuff, right? And it's really hard, and they're good at it. Then they go to Roblox, why? Because they can create their own games. But then they graduate to Fortnite with Epic Games, right? And that's the big deal, right? Because that's more social and communal and wow. You know, so, so this step-by-step -step, you know, way of going through the process, and, I, you know, and, as, and it's going to happen with the trades. It's not you know, the architects being cool with, with PR novels or you know, some GC out there, love the GCs, but it's going to be the people doing the work that are going to then entice from a vocational way the kids, because they're already there, right? That they're already in that digital world. That's their home. And especially over COVID, that's their social home as well. Being able to cross that chasm and get younger generation into our profession, all of our professions, that is the big key. I, I, I don't know about you guys, but I know with me, we're living right now in a world where I don't have enough of anything, right? So I live in Memphis now, right? Do you know that two weeks ago, there were no garage doors to be had within 400 miles of Memphis? Garage doors, a shortage economy, here we go, right? And then try and find labor to actually install it. Right? It's like, where are we going to find the people to work? Right? So we're in a bit of a very interesting space right now that I'm starting to see that if you're starting to do things like putting into the context of what gaming is all about and make that part of a deliverable, wow, now all of a sudden, that's kind of like honey bees. Even my 11 year old son going, can you explain that again? It's like, you know, it's kind of cool. But this is where we start to see real, real traction. So these virtual worlds, which are done for the built environment, like our jobs, you know, building something out of nothing, which I still think is the coolest damn thing on the planet being part of our industry, right? But the after effects, what do you do with that digital information? So I have friends uh, up in Santa Monica and, and in and around Hollywood uh, that we work with very closely uh, because we are starting to take a lot of our digital assets and then making them part of other stories. And what do I mean by that? Well, there was a group, well, Epic Games behind Fortnite, right? They have this thing called the Unreal Gaming Engine. It's a development tool that allows people to put 3D worlds together and make them look very photorealistic. It's very cool. Well, they hooked up with a group called Industrial Light and Magic, the special effects groups behind Star Wars, right? And they created this thing called the Stagecraft Volume. It's the world's first digital sound stage. There's a picture of it. It's a 270 degree concave screen with a screen that is also on the ceiling. They use LED lights in different formats, you know, cool light, warm light, all that stuff, millions of them, to create these environments that, that are immersive for the actors. The first famous one to pop out of this is the entire Mandalorian series uh, from Disney Plus, if you remember that, right? And what was cool about this was, not only did they immerse, and then they go, okay, next scene, and they will click, and guess what, the entire thing changes. But the cool part about it is that they say over 30% of post-production time, because there's no green screen technology, because the LED creates the shadow, creates the reflections, all these things that you normally don't get. Fundamentally, it's changed Hollywood. I'm gonna show you what we're doing a little bit later, but, what we're doing now is working directly with them, with the Obi-Wan series, the uh, Book of Boba Fett, and all of those ones that, that are using this particular studio, because they're taking our digital assets and reusing them. I'm making more money leasing my digital stuff to Disney than I ever did about creating construction documents and putting up a building. Isn't that amazing? The economics are what's gonna change a lot of what happens in our industry. We're also looking at project controls. Uh, what we're seeing now, uh, these are part of our models for the uh, now just closed Dubai World Expo 2020. Um, and the photorealism is fun, but what we're able to do is actually put this into a project control environment. And we use this technology that was used to build the NVIDIA headquarters up in Silicon Valley, where we take like a situation and it's a 20 foot by 20 foot by 20 foot cube, right? And what we do is we use that as as part of the job trail, right? And what we do is we can actually bring people into an environment where you're immersed, either in one-to-one -one scale, or you can get the scale that you want, 
either for the whole room or just on that wall so they can actually solve problems right there so when you went out in the field you know exactly what's going on. The simulation stuff on this is mind-boggling. That technology is called the VimCube, um, if you want to check it out online, the VimCube.com, and it's a fantastic way, again, of taking communication to the next level because if, and this is the big if, if the construction documents are drawn properly, you can actually get real results. Here's my problem. I'm going to guesstimate right now, 50% of the building information models I get are crap. I can't build from them. Right? They look really good. You know, in the world of, of construction documents, when I grew up you know, with you know, straight edge and triangles and leads, if you had a bad day, it was because you could see that you know, your lettering was a little off or the dimension lines didn't hit. And a more experienced designer would come in and say, hey, what's going on? And get to the problem and actually get buildable construction documents. Well, now we've got a bunch of kids that understand that the fonts are great all the time. They have perfect uh, you know, dimension lines, but they don't know how to build a building. And it's very frustrating. And it's almost getting to the point where I wish the trades would come together on, and be on a project basis and actually be part of that design process and start telling these designers, listen, I don't know why you do that, 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 that detail that way, because that's not the way it's done in the field. And having that two-way communication is what makes a better building. So I get very frustrated sometimes because I think that a lot of people, you know, my mind in, in, in the world of architecture, you know, bin wash does not make a good building. Right? And the fact that you have to do some things in 3D and then you publish out two-dimensional drawings, stick with CAD and you're better at it. Right? So I get a lot of frustration when it comes to construction documents and I don't have all the answers, but I do have the project controls. Again, if you have the proper information, to be a valuable way of actually making sure that we put technology into the right context. Right? Because at the end of the day, my big job, because I'm still building the built environment, is to make sure that the project and the project teams get the proper technology. Meaning that not everyone has to be a BIM expert. Actually, I don't want people touching BIM a lot of the times. What I want, though, is having that coordination. And I'm starting to see tools like uh, ProWorp doing a good job out there as an overall platform. Project Ready, Kahula. These are newer names for, for technologies that are not saying you have to be inside of our world, like Construction Cloud, or BIM 360, whatever the is calling that thing, or Bentley calls their stuff their own thing. I think those days are gone with the fiefdoms because APIs, APIs are the things that connect things together so that if your company is using one piece of software, you can communicate with another group that's using a totally different piece of software through this translator called an API. API-driven platforms are important to be what creates the project management models of the future. I know that's what we're using, we're experimenting with all of those, and so far so good. Because you're not having to reinvent the wheel every time, and you're not forcing the people to use technologies. I've got to learn that one now. I mean, I really feel for the trades, because you've got to do so many different projects and so many different folks at so many different levels of technological promise. And you know, it's like, you guys are reacting, and, and that sucks. So I think there's better days ahead only because the technologies that are being created outside of our industry are now being introduced to our industry. Um, we're also a big fan of looking at technologies, the fourth utility, you know, you have mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and IT now. The idea of having a building as a computer is becoming more real by the day. Only because we have groups like Dell Computer that are now looking at this term edge computing in such a different way that it's mind-blowing. So you know now when you put in a building, and let's say you need to get Wi-Fi, right? You go to Verizon, Comcast, ATT, whoever your local provider is, and you pay them a monthly fee in order to have connectivity. Why? Because we think of IT last. So Dell rethought things, and I approached uh, them in Austin, and I and had a big meeting with them. I said, you know, I want to build a data center, but I want it to be sustainable. I don't want it to be this big hub of having to have a lot of AC which creates a lot of power issues, right, because it's a big hog. And at the end of the day, you know, when we're dealing with, you know, that amount of heat and, and then having to cool it, it's just not really good for not only the environment, but just, it's just not right. Is there a different way of doing it? And they said, well, you know, we're experimenting in Bahrain uh, that we created the equivalent of like this huge bathtub, and we submerged all the racks of servers into this liquid, and it's kind of like a oil-based liquid. And it saved cooling like by 80%. I said, yeah, yeah, that's cool. 
looks good. What happens to the oil? Right? Because now I'm effect after you're done with it. Right? So I said, there's got to be a, a, a better way. So Mejo that runs up the data center in the world right now, and check out the big service. It's Facebook, Meta, uh, Google, Twitter. I mean, they're the data center kings for that. So they also are asking questions. You know, is, is there a better way to do the data center than there is? Edge computing is when you take all those components that are inside of the data center and you can put them into the built environment. In other words, how about hanging off the exterior of the building or being part of you know, a streetscape, hiding it under a bench and having all this stuff talk to each other? Well, we're doing that. And the cool part about that means that we have to start thinking like a fourth utility because now we're creating our own private network from the core and shell. We're not waiting until the finish is happening like, okay, well, let's, let's stick a Wi-Fi station up there. That's like really old school thinking. You can create your own private network now on a per building basis, on a square block, community, or an entire city, and you don't need the carriers. Wow, now all of a sudden we have something different here because we have petabytes of data that can go between the buildings. Think of the buildings, like the, the, the internet of buildings, that they're flopping the differences of data around all the time. We're also working with Tesla. Does anyone here own the Tesla? Mm -hmm. Oh, I mean, you're good luck. That's gonna be your biggest revenue stream. Check out what's happening. I thought that Tesla was all about EV and eventually going to an autonomous, or an autonomous driving car, right? That's, that was the pathway. I thought that was like this big thing. No. What they're not telling Tesla owners is, you just bought a ticket to the dance because you have a computer that's very accurate, that's always on. You know, just look at the navigation on the screen, like beautiful, it makes Google Earth look like crap, right? Well, what's cool about that is that it has a lot of computing power in it, but you're not using all of it. So when you go into an environment that has edge computing, it's going to ask you, can we purchase for the time that you're in this area some of the power of your hard drive? They're, they're going to pay you money to drive a Tesla. It's brilliant. That's almost as cool as those two you know, SpaceX rockets coming down and just sticking it out in the ocean. Just, yeah. Elon, he's, he's a weird dude, man, but I, I have a lot of respect. But, I mean, that's just great thinking, right? So we now have static ways of looking at, at computing being built into the built environment, into the walls, floors, and ceilings of buildings, internally, externally, and then we have the dynamic power of being able to hop onto these EVs that have a lot of computing power that are going to be part of this ecosystem. That's the fourth utility. Fantastic new way of rethinking what's going on out there. And then, of course, the final one here about rethinking your technology is this idea of the customer experience. Right? In the case of architects, engineers, contractors, certain owners, this is where digital communities are really starting to, to, to blossom. Here's a case in four. So there's this server, right? I mean, that's always a server, but they create a virtual world called Decentraland. And the, the idea behind decentralization is at the essence of this database uh, framework called blockchain. And all blockchain is is an algorithm that tells databases, we trust these points of data in, in a chain, and it's now immutable. It can't be changed ever. But we've now done this chain of data in a block blockchain. It's very, very simple. There's a lot of people, though, that then can take that concept because you can then create things like smart contracts off of that. Meaning that there's always a parent and a child, right? In the case of the University of Architects contracts, it goes from owner to architect, owner to GC, GC to subcontractor. You've seen them, right? Um, 1.8 million projects in the United States annually use those contracts. They're going to the blockchain. Why? Because it creates immutable data. Things can't hide. It's so transparent, it's scared the crap out of you. So people that are making money off inefficiencies of our industry are going to be the biggest guys to say, I hate this thing. Well, of course you do. We're taking money off your uh, food off your table because that's an inefficiency. Right now, the way that the documents are done, the, the AGC's uh, consent stops or the engineers' EJCDCs or the AIA contracts, uh, they're all done in PDF right now. But when you actually then get into this idea of a virtual world meeting a, a physical world, we're starting to get into a very interesting space. And that space really starts with, uh, you know, starting with me saying, what happens to that asset after we've done our job, after the contract ends? So right now we're working with all three groups, the AGC, the engineering groups, and the AIA, to think through 
do we need to take the existing documents and extend them for the entire life cycle of that digital asset? Because the digital asset continues to live after the contract is done. Or do we need a whole new series of contracts just on digital assets? Because the way that you do these virtual worlds is that you have to be the player. And that player means that you need to be a thing inside this virtual world that represents you. It's called an avatar. Now, this is from technology that we use uh, with our technology partners called Iconic Engine. They're a subsidiary of a group called Digital Domain in Hollywood that did the, uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe special effects. So everything from Iron Man to the Avengers, you know, I mean, they're just huge, right? And we learned a lot from them about how to take things like, how about like an iPhone 12, iPhone 13, that has a little thing on here called Measure. I don't know if you've ever, ever used it, but Measure actually takes a wider look around the space, and you get an accurate dimension model, it builds a model, a light model, of a reality capture to, uh, to, one, to one millimeter accuracy. I mean, it's a fantastic little tool, right? Well, you can do the same thing by capturing yourself, playing basketball, or how you walk your gait. You can actually do your face, how you laugh, how you squint, when you smile, and you start capturing all of that, and that's how these avatars are being made. You take that avatar, and then you can put them and this is the big thing that I learned from uh, my son playing Fortnite. He's an avatar, and he can be anything he wants. They have different choices. Uh, and you know, you can be male or female, whatever color you want. But the big thing is over on, uh, on, on the right-hand side are the skins. Skins are like uniforms, or you can buy weapons, or shields, and all these things, right? There's actually a currency, a digital currency in Fortnite called V-Bucks. If you ever go down to like a Ralph's or anything like that, and you see like, you know, when you buy TGI Fridays, you know, gift cards and stuff like that, look at the Fortnite stuff, V-Bucks, okay? It's like for 50 bucks, you get like 5,000 V-Bucks, right? And that's the currency that the kids use to buy all their skins, and they put it into like their wardrobe, and then whatever they want to be during that game, they put it on. Why is this important? Last month, the revenues of V-Buck purchases at Epic Games was $1.2 billion. Right? Like, the, the business is like, not my world, I'm paying attention to it, follow the money. Because where this is really going is into a world where we do have interactive with this. The reason why I mentioned BenQ as, as, a, as a really cool additive to a job trailer, right, as a situation, is because last summer, during the UEFA Cup, which is the European Soccer Championships, at Wembley Stadium, we actually did a paper view version of that inside of our virtual world in the metaverse and had different people be different things. The guy inside the goggles is actually immersed. The guy on the right hand side though, that's what you look like through an app. So this is actually a, a, a photograph of the, the guy doing the AR sitting next to the guy that's in immersive. So you have, you have augmented reality and virtual reality both watching the soccer match at the same time, interacting. This is the exact equivalent of, if you remember the Jedi Council in the Star Wars movies, the holograms, that's that. Okay, so where's this being done? NVIDIA was all over this. Because now, this just isn't Zoom, this is Zoom on steroids. Because now, you can actually be now interacting for a situation on a project in real time and actually get it solved so that when you actually physically get out to the site, things get resolved. Imagine that. So this, these are the types of things that we're getting really, really um, excited about. What we're also getting excited about is this idea of Amazon Web Services and Microsoft Azure. Those days are numbered. They're gone. Why? Because of things like this. This is my friend Gabrielle. She runs Epic Games Medicaid. This is the scariest damn stuff I've ever seen. Why? Because it uses artificial intelligence and live capture through a GoPro camera through a script that she uses for showing all your emotions, all your movements, and it starts to remember all of those in real time as an avatar. Of course, it's much higher grade, right, because these are now gigabytes worth of avatars that have to now fit inside the game. So what we're doing is we're actually creating an elephant, but we're trying to push it through these online cloud services that are the size of a straw. When you go to edge computing, you've created the top. So you can start seeing how all this stuff is starting to morph. This humanoid, uh, as she now has a, I believe she has a couple of thousand humanoids now, uh, of different people. The idea is the games never end in the world of Fortnite 
roadblocks, all these things. And what we're trying to show is that, like a game, our buildings never end until they're demolished, right? They live at night, because there's not a lot of people in them. Or, through sheer work, maybe there is. The idea is we have now the equivalency of what happens in the game that never ends. We have a building that never ends, which means we need avatars that are always there, potentially. Right? And if the avatars, if you physically can't be there to make the decisions, are we starting to get to the threshold? Not there yet, but at the threshold that artificial intelligence will then be your decision making, how you laugh, how you talk, how you make your decisions over time because the human mind understands. And your human mind can then be on multiple projects. Are we solving our issues with having no superintendents because we can't find them in the marketplace? Well, let's, let's calm you. Right? We're that close. And that's what that game is up against. This stuff gets a lot of fun, though, when you start getting into uh, you know, how we uh, start to take a look at location-based experiences. So we were asked by Ford Motor Company uh, for their uh, check dealerships uh, to start to explain what a dealership could look like in the future. Where, you know, you go and you buy a car, and you, it's always a good cop, bad cop thing. Oh, I've got to my manager, blah, blah, blah. And, and you always feel like you're getting money on the table. It's such a horrible experience, right? But what happens now in Carvana, which is actually not doing too good, but they're kicking the butt right now of all the major dealerships, right? Vending machines for cars. I'm old school, I like to test drive, but there's people that don't like the apps, right? So what they're doing is that they're rethinking things. So they wanted to know, what does a virtual world look like? I mean, the dealership is no longer just about selling cars, but selling experiences that becomes part of the community. Gains trust so that people will always buy a Ford 150. F-150, right? So it's bringing in that, into that community this idea of what and starting to rethink how do we start to interact with both the virtual communities that are being made, and how does this then come, you know, come back into the world of reality? So what we've done is, well, we started to take a stab at what would happen with walls and ceilings if we made them part of the overall experience of entertainment? So we worked with uh, Netflix uh, with their hit TV show, Stranger Things, that this season four, there's gonna be certain episodes where a QR code is gonna pop up. You take your camera on your phone, either an iPad or an iPhone or, or an Android, and it will then say, you know, pops up a little link. It's gonna pop up into this app and what's going to happen is, it's going to use the LiDAR to take the, a quick view of your living room, right? And let's say you have a big 80-inch screen, uh, you know, flat-screen TV. And what we're doing is that at that moment in that scene, the monsters from the upside down are not coming out through your TV screen, but they're coming up out of your floor. They're coming in through the door. They're coming up back behind you on the couch. And it automatically then makes your phone like a lightsaber so that you can actually fight that. So, when you think about walls and ceilings, I'm looking at them as the new medium for entertainment. It's no longer just keeping things from you know, shelter and you know, that type of thing. So, that's Netflix doing this. Uh, there's some very, very special things going on at Disney that I can't talk about, but you can see where a lot of this is going, where the building becomes a computer. When that happens, we also now have the opportunity to get into places where I think there's a lot of kids that and shysters out there um, that saw you know, the tulips in Amsterdam as a way of making some money off of things called non-functional tokens. Now, I've been at blockchain since about 2015, and I'm still in it, right? But I'm doing it from the idea of business, smart contracts. How does that really work, right? And I'll show you a quick example about, about how it does work. But this is where things get interesting. Non-fungible tokens are known now as a place where unbelievable amounts of money can be made because people believe that a bored ape, little pixelated piece of art, is worth $4 million and someone pays for it and there's an exchange in it. I don't get it. I just don't get it. But when you take a look at NFTs and how they fit into a smart contract, it also makes a lot of sense. We're looking at the CSI categories, you know, those, those divisions. I like the 16 divisions, I'm still old school, right? And of course, you know, Division eight with doors and windows. Division nine finishes. You guys, right? Now all of a sudden, things make sense when you start to put NFTs in place because what the NFT says is that I'm going to take this amount of information, all the specifications for the interior of that room, and I can now make it part of the smart contract 
which means I can measure it. We're looking at creating NFTs as the, as the digital birth certificates for the built environment. Because now all of a sudden you can really measure things, especially in the life cycle. So remember I said things about ESGs are going to be really important for publicly traded companies to pay attention to? This is how change happens. So I was at the COP26 uh, meeting, uh, the meeting of the climate change thing in, uh, in Glasgow. I thought a lot of them was horse shit, other stuff that really woke me up. So again, we're still in that period of trying to understand, you know, what is this thing? But we never sat down with 10 of the largest general contractors in Europe, and we got a finger wag from a bunch of parents, quite frankly, but they were ministers of the EU. And they more or less said, you guys, the architects and contractors, are responsible for 40% of all the uh, carbon footprint in Europe every year. Most of it is through demolition. Figure out a plan in three years and come back to us, otherwise we're gonna start legislating law. Would you imagine? Right? So, Skanska, uh, out of Sweden, they said, well, uh, we know some people, and I knew a guy named Ray Robinson at Oxford University, and they hired him as a team to start thinking of what can we do. A lot of the things they're looking at is reusable components. That's a step in the right direction. Uh, but they're also looking now at NFTs as a way now of saying, hey, wait a second, we're not the only problem here. How about the building product manufacturers that are creating this stuff and giving us the problem to begin with? So. How about we go to GAF, right? And we start to measure all of the 10-year asphalt shingle roofs. And we start to see, over a period of time, because the NFTs are immutable, they're gonna tell us the, the proper story, that on the average, you're probably about 7.2 years. Your sound is a bit rocked. Get your crap together, otherwise your ESG is gonna hit your stock and you're gonna be in trouble. That's the thought process, it's called the Internet of Materials. And we're taking a look at every single building product manufacturer because we can now get down to every component. And it's not about selling more apes. It's about trying to do something positive with the technology that's there. So, you know, this whole idea of crypto and all that crap, yeah, they're kind of there. Um, not a big believer yet. I, I, I've owned Bitcoin for a very long time. Um, but again, it's, it's a folly. It's not really the reality that I'm seeing about how this can work inside of our community. I think it's going to be very powerful. So you may not have to understand it today, but just know that you've heard it you know, back in 2022 that the NFTs are going to be, by definition, part of the specifications from here on out, only because it's so important, it's so easy to start this idea of a life cycle way of looking at things. So this is what I wanted to show you, how it really works in the world of, of us. So the AIA contracts are now going to be tied to construction documentation so tightly that we're, not, that we're going to be pleased, a lot of us, for this one reason, here's one workflow. So in the building information model, that's part of the control systems, like I mentioned before. Right? Uh, we also have smart contracts that sit in the middle, and we got blockchain. Well, when you go down to this level, right, right now we're really requiring in our general conditions that all systems, furniture, fixture, equipment, appliances, things like that, have to have a geotag to be put onto our job site. That's on the building part or the local assembly to trust or something like that. Now, what that means is that we can have a QR code, we can have a QR code, or we can have RFID, right? Now, what happens there is that as work gets put in place, in this case, a truss, you know, over here, right? That GPS is reading from the RFID that that particular truss has been put in place. It automatically goes through the smart contract to the two-day, uh, the two-week look ahead, the daily report, and of course, the bigger schedule. Yes, this was supposed to be installed by this date. We then wait 24 hours, and we have a super go out with technologies like structure con and other types of things, LIDAR, taking reality capture to see if it was put in place in a quality manner. Big important piece there, right? Because to say it's in place, who cares? What was it done properly? After that 24 hour period, the blockchain says everything meets the criteria, hits builderpay.io, and the subcontractors pay immediately. Would you like to get paid quicker? Yeah. That's what this does. It speeds up the velocity of decision making and starts to control things like supply chain and most importantly, work in place. And you're not waiting for the check to come and the dog ate it. Right. So this automated thing has worked. Uh, we've tested down a little over 100 projects. 
The cool part about all this data, that's just one workflow, is that it seeps down aggregated into a very large database. We're finally going to have empirical data that we can say, this is what it costs in this part of the United States, with these laborers with this type of quality. Finally, we don't have to wait for McKinsey to come and wag their finger at saying that we suck as an industry. Go screw yourselves, management consultants, making up freaking things. They were saying like, you know, it was a $4 trillion industry here in the US. What? What? The real numbers go to Dodge. You know, it, you know it's about 1.4 to 1.8 million if you put in industrial. Get your numbers right, because once we have numbers, we have facts, and once we have facts, we can make better decisions. Analysis, reports, based on yeah. These are going to be the important things, especially with the kids that are coming up. So here's a little bit about how we are taking edge computing to the next level. Uh, in China, before I moved back here, so I, I've been in China, in China since 1994. Uh, I moved back about six years ago after being in Shanghai for about seven and a half years, so like immersed living there. Um, and just to prove that everything's made in China, I went there, I was single, I came back with a wife and a son, so everything's made in China. Um, the cool part about what we were doing over there was that I, I met uh, an Australian engineer who was working with Rio Tinto, a big mining company, and he was creating these big rectangles, almost like mobile homes, for the workers, for the yeah. miners. And as we were talking, he said, you know, I've always wanted to do this on an industrial basis, but do really pleasing aesthetic work. So we did the design. He had the way of doing the factory. It took us eight years to get it right. But at our height, uh, we were selling this off to uh, uh, real estate developers, one in Russell Island, Australia, on the coast of Brisbane. Those 4,000 units, we were so good at getting the lines to work properly, from raw material to finished product. 2,500 square foot homes, zero defects, zero waste in seven minutes finished. Seven minutes. So Forbes, didn't believe it. And so we invited the, uh, uh, you know, the people to go inspect it. And the journalists came back shocked. They were recording it after six minutes. And the quality of this isn't so much the speed as it was what we were trying to learn from how to put a building together that would actually have a fourth utility in IT. So what we're taking a look at here isn't just a home. And by the way, these are all configurable because they're all done through what's called structurally insulated panels, right, which are pressurized, and then we use uh, CNC routers to actually do the fenestrations and conduit all the way through. Now, the cool part about this is that, let's go back to Stranger Things with Netflix, right? We are now talking with Amazon, Disney, Warner, which is now Discovery, uh, and, and, uh, and, and Netflix, about how our homes, when you actually stick them together in, in, a, you know, in, in a community, creates the internet of buildings, but it also creates no need for an Xbox, no need for an Apple TV box, no need for Comcast, Verizon, or ATT. They were gonna hate me at the end of this thing. Because we're taking their business away because you're creating boxes just by creating the building. This is really important for you guys because now all of a sudden you have a value because you're not just you know, you know, throwing up walls and ceilings, you're actually part of a much bigger picture. And I think that's gonna be the next conversation is how do you insert yourself value-wise because you're now creating entertainment boxes, learning boxes, transactional boxes for Amazon. Those are going to be the next things in our industry that really inspire me, that they really go on. Um, our housing styles have changed over time. Uh, we are now uh, ready to announce, you guys are the first association to hear it. Uh, we'll probably be making an announcement no later than the end of June, but probably around July 4th that outside of Nashville, Tennessee, we're putting a two million square foot factory to create functional workhouse housing. Uh, these are going to be multifamily. Uh, they're going to be built exactly the way that I, I described it. We are actively working with Amazon because Amazon just opened up a 10,000 employee operations center in downtown Nashville on Broadway. So it's operational. Oracle is building another campus just in order to where the Titans play football on the East Bank for another 10,000. Then, of course, the big news, one hour away just to the west, Blue Oval City, Ford, is putting up 180,000 jobs, where there's no one there right now. They're creating a factory town for creating batteries. That's Ford morphs into an EV type of uh, operation. So that, let's add that up. That's 200,000 homes 
Right now, Davidson County, which is where Nashville is, their inventory is minus 87,000. Holy cow. So right now, let's say a, a section, I, I think they're called section five or section nine, HUD uh, type of home, which looks like this. Four units, multifamily. Right now, each one of those units at a thousand square feet delivered is $410,000. And this is for affordable housing, right? This unit right here, those four units, each unit is gonna sell for under $120,000 in store. How do we do that? Well, through national contracts, being able to build in supply chains, and making sure that uh, you know, the, the workers that we have are just the best in the world. So this can be done. Uh, I said in the Forbes article that I will never enter the US marketplace for authorities having jurisdictional issues, that type of thing. We're only gonna be doing one of these, only one, because we, we want it to be a showcase. And the idea then is that we would franchise this all to different areas of the United States as needed. So we do think that you know, working with Amazon, we would be able to work with their Amazon uh, Alexa team. So you know, if anyone has Alexa or any of those home devices, uh, you can talk to it and learn your behaviors over time. It's called the Genius Platform. Um, I thought I was going to hate it because I do some funky stuff at home. I didn't want people hearing it. So. <laughs> but I, I kind of love my Alexa. It does a lot of things for me, right? We're building it now into the home. You don't need an Echo Dock. So we're building actually full scale Echo Docks for these things. Uh, again, House would be the platform. When we put the platform together as a community, we're starting to see the idea that putting together data from Ring, from Nest, all of these things for safety, security, and comfort and entertainment that we think that we just want to be an example so that others will take care of it. Uh, I'm also proud to announce that uh, we are working with one of the nation's largest development companies in order to get the sales channel in place. So this is going to be a big deal when we can actually get product off the lines. Right now we're looking probably one year from now to actually get these things done. But we think we're at a good price point. Uh, the idea again is to prove things out, uh, make it our sandbox, uh, and this is where things really change. So everything I showed you is cool, but it's not really where my heart is. My heart is with water, believe it or not, right? Because I'm a firm believer that the next war is going to be all about water, right? Clean water. So the big deal that I found out was a friend of mine, I lost touch with him like 20 years ago. We were busy together, we made a lot of money, had a lot of fun. Just lost touch with him. He lives in Lexington, Kentucky. He's a guy that introduced me to horses and all that stuff down there, so it was I have a soft spot in my heart for uh, him and him and But he hooked up with a friend of his, his name is Dr. Tim Finfrock, that about 20 years ago, he discovered that through hydrogen working, he was a nuclear scientist at uh, Rockwell, that he could separate the H and the two O's that make up water, and when you do that, it excites the molecules so much that it's called a free radical. It does one big thing when it's a free radical. It destroys everything to the molecular level that's in front of it. So he created a system in a, uh, about the size of a carry-on luggage, a 14-step step system that you can take polluted water, be it leachable water from a landfill, be it just plain material pollution, to uh, wastewater management for human waste. Right? And it breaks it apart to such a level that it cleans it so that when the ancient two come back together again, you have powerful water as a vending machine. So he sold this, well, he licensed it exclusively to NASA, and that's how the International Space Station actually cleans the water as that product, right, for the astronauts when they have to go and they have to work. The cool part about it is that just about a year ago, he came out from underneath that exclusive contract, and he's now trying to productize it. We're trying to help him. This is a decentralized way, just like blockchain is a decentralized accounting type of system-ish type of thing, right? And we love the idea of decentralization because it creates resiliency. So what we're able to do is work with a UN NGO called Water for the World. And as we're sitting here tonight, 2,800 of these units are being rolled out in Kenya. The next uh, country we're going to is Sierra Leone, and then the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa. This thing's going to be huge. But what we're doing is we're doing two things. We, we created a special company, uh, an LLC, called uh, Hydro Distill. And we're going up along the Bourbon Trail, all in the, all in the part of Kentucky because the largest growth of any liquor in the world during COVID was bourbon. So thank you. <laughs> because what it's done is that it's also caused a big problem because it had increased capacity to create more fluid water because of the distillery process and EPA is coming down hard on it. 
So this solves their problem. So this is going to be rolled out uh, at the end of May, uh, actually next week, uh, as part of, uh, of taking care of that issue. But the bigger issue is that we're going to now have this as we do not need to create a wastewater treatment plant at $100 million a pop when we can use this as a networked way of doing decentralized waste management for all the hospitals. So this is a really, really cool thing that I'm pumped for because each one of these units costs $20,000 a piece. So the other piece of this is the, is the not the polar opposite, but a different branch of what we do when we separate each of the two rows, the Dr. Finfox process. The other way this happens is, oh, let me show you. So I believe this is the, yeah, here we go. Do you see those bubbles? The bubble bubbles? It's almost like if you took a straw and you went into a bottle of water and you blew into it. Well, that's oxygenated bubbles. This is hydrogenated bubbles, very dense. Then what happens is if you put a flame source or any sort of electronic arc, it pops and explodes, just like a hydrogen bomb. But this is controlled and it's much smaller, but it creates enough energy to turn turbines. You're looking at the world's first iteration of a perpetual engine. I mean, physics says this can't happen. I can bring you to Lexington and watch it happen. They did it. The separation of the H and the tools is the big deal because again, that free radical creates such energy, creates the density that's necessary that can turn turbines. So right now, Dr. Finfrock is very afraid about really showing this in public. I said, well, I'll show it um, because he's afraid like he's going to get assassinated by the energy power companies of the world because this changes everything, right? We now have energy that can be created from purified water, which means that the gutter systems, right, I think are going to change fundamentally once this becomes the natural thing that you just put into a building, right? Because you can capture the rainwater, go through the, the, uh, you know, the clean process of it, and then just push it back into your engine and you got free energy. So we're that close. We're that close. A lot of this stuff in innovations, I, you know, I, I love it because it creates uh, you know, inspiration for you to get up every day. Uh, and then I just want to show you uh, some final slides about how all this works together. So transportation is so tied to housing, it's crazy. I mean, yesterday, uh, the White House put out an entire issue about the housing crisis and said we're going to start with the Department of Transportation. Right? Because it makes all the sense in the world. Where you live, you've got to get to where you work or shop and that type of thing. And we're pretty bad at it. Um, just take a look at the buses you know, here in Orange County. They look so beautiful, don't they? No, it looks like an engineer design. Sorry, engineers, but you know, get an architect and put flair to it. Right? So that's what we did. Um, I went to Tesla, I went to GM, I went to Mercedes, and I went to Toyota. And I had a checkbook that said, I need an autonomous public transportation system. And they said, we'll sell you a driverless car. Well, you guys don't get it. So we did our own. These were our designs. We worked with Peter Frieda, the people behind the Lamborghini and the long and top shelf. Right? And this is what we delivered uh, into Qingdao, China. And what these are are autonomous bu uh, buses at three different scales. One is a 20 meter for commuter, 12 meter, which is typical for inner city, and the first mile, last mile, two meter pod. It has been working famously. We really love this project. Uh, right now, we are working with the Tennessee Department of transportation uh, to have this February uh, for a pilot test up and down Broadway in Nashville of this system. So keep tuned. Uh, I think there's still hope because the entertainment factor and the educational piece of this I think is going to be huge. Uh, partnered up with um, Lockheed Martin and NASA. And we took all of NASA's uh, uh, 3D work with the surface of Mars and the Mars rover captured. And we worked then with Washington DC public school system, that we retrofitted one of the school buses with AR built-in uh, screens that were really just windows. Right? And what we did was we then mapped where the bus routes would go to the surface of Mars, and then we put the kids in the bus for a field trip to go to Mars. And they could interact with the screens and learn more, and it has just been a huge hit. Um, what this said to me, though, is that what, what could we do with the interiors of autonomous vehicles, because you don't have to drive. So is it a place just to sit back and passively watch your favorite show, maybe? Uh, I know in Nashville, we're actually bringing back uh, you know, people that uh, are famous, that have passed away in, in the uh, you know, country western uh, you know, world of music. 
so that when we're transporting people from the airport into downtown, there's like an entertainment thing to that. But I think we're just starting to learn what the art of the possible is with this stuff. Uh, and it all comes down to uh, just having an open mind and seeing if we can just do things differently. So this was the project I originally showed you. This was uh, Jet Economic City. Uh, this, but the one fact that I wanted to, to talk about this, one criteria we had from the prints that bankrolled this entire thing was that he wanted a, an entire autonomous vehicle city, almost like when you go into Disney and then you're in the Disney transportation system, very similar, right? But there is one road that will have a combustion, a combustion engine car that's allowed to drive on it. And he had it there for his own car because he's living at the top of the bridge, right? And he wanted to, 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 to come in and out in his Ferrari. So we have one street called Ferrari, right? So I know you guys have Ferraris in the street. Nice to have money, right? The other you know, project I wanted to show you here is this one. Uh, this is uh, in, right outside of Seoul, South Korea. Um, I got pulled into the world of Hollywood um, really big because of the way that we're looking at things like water and energy, data centers, the idea of working with uh, you know, the Disney Plus folks. I want to show you this because we're thinking differently about how all this works. Um, this is going to be the new home for Netflix Korea that had a big hit called Squid Game, if you watch that. They're doing Squid Game 2 here, which is kind of cool. Uh, and they also were famous for uh, an Academy Award winning uh, uh, movie called Parasite. So the Korean market's very hot and we're really delivering this to them. Everything I showed you in the is going to happen in this smart city, this smart studio city. Um, we're also taking the smaller scale of this, uh, where we're looking and working right now negotiating with AMC theaters uh, to not just have passive places to watch IMAX or, or enhanced view type of um, movies, because they're losing a lot of money, even though they're retrofitting all the theaters. We're looking at doing 10 different types of experiences digitally, and then also have the passive places still going to run the movie theater. It's called IDX, or Infinite Experience. Uh, and it looks like that we, of course, fingers this week will have a partnership with what's called White House Immersive. These are people behind the Van Gogh exhibit. I don't know if you saw that immersive Van Gogh stuff and whatnot. So again, just a different way of taking a look at the interiors of buildings and having them do something. Uh, this is our Qingdao International Virtual Garden theme park. Uh, this is on the, on the coast uh, outside of Beijing. It's Qingdao. If you know the Qingdao beer, the green bottle beer from China, that's where it's brewed. Uh, the VR theme part of this, uh, we hired the people that were uh, let go by Disney, Walt Disney Imagineers to do this, and again, we're now rethinking all of this because the experiences inside of Disneyland is scientific. They know how long you're going to wait for them. That's part of the ride. They know how long the ride is. They know that, that the ride that comes into a retail experience, and they know if you're going to go right or left in the exit. That's how good they are. But that's in a controlled environment. What happens? when the physical limitations of these pavilions are no longer restricted because you're inside the metaverse. So we're rethinking the space between the buildings and what those experiences will be, and eventually when you get home. The cool part, and the reason why I want to show you this, and the last point of the evening, is that we are now releasing this particular park in December of this year up online as a virtual experience, and we're charging for it. Right? You get to charge like, like an like a attendance fee. And we're working with Epic Games, we're working with Blizzard Activision, we're working with Tencent, all the big guys. And they love it because we're kind of like a portal. But we're going to actually have all of our 3D models, the places for people to go in there, so that two years before we actually open, we're making revenues that, that we're lowering our construction loan by 13%. So this stuff's real. This is real money. This is a $1.6 billion program. We're saving hundreds of millions of dollars by doing it this way. Oh, this is from uh, uh, April. Uh, this is the construction. Photographs of that particular park. So yeah, um, life is going fast. Um, I think that the things I want to just leave you with, I, I know I just hit you with fires, is a couple of things. Number one, I have an Oculus Quest 2 down here. Uh, I have it configured. If you want to take a trip, if you've never been in a virtual world or VR, please you know, let me show you what, what, what it looks like. It's kind of fun. Uh, number two, you know, digital twins are real. So don't be afraid of the term. Just know that that means big means cat. We've already been there, we've, we've been doing that. So don't let any kid you know, try and talk you into something that's not real. This stuff is real, but I would highly recommend communicating with them because they are leading the world in virtual worlds and this idea of outer space. This idea of blockchain is not a bunch of, you know, of crypto bros. You know, uh, this is real, it's gonna be part of our contracts as we move forward. 
Um, and that's what I really want to leave you with. And uh, Albert, thank you for the invitation and all the talented people over at the WCCA. Say that fast 10 times. <laughs> Get tongue twisted. But um, my, my name is Paul. Uh, I am an architect. Uh, I'm still trying to recover from it. If you have any questions, I have like the coolest business card ever. You know why? Because it's not a card anymore. I can touch your phone. Look, this thing's called me. And it's just like, it downloads like me, not like the human one yet, but that will get there. And it's, it's really cool to get like all my social media stuff and pictures and all sorts of things. So if you want to exchange business cards, I can tap your phone. And with that, thank you very much. Give her a round So, uh, yeah, fire hose, that's an understatement. Uh, give him another round. That was fantastic. <laughs> So, as is the tradition, uh, you know, the, the association likes to give a gift to our speakers. You know, and I'm seeing NFTs, and I'm seeing avatars, and all kinds of really cool future stuff. And right now, I'm going to give Paul a piece of wood. <laughs> Paul, did. this is a indicative of our association. It's a level, it's a carpenter's level. It's Original, it's got her insignia on it, and so we say thank you for coming here. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, piece of wood. All right, that I'm still blown away by that. I thought I was up on what's going on, but I am close. Miss Jane, can I get your help up here, please? Don't forget to try on those glasses. I'm going to take you somewhere on a little trip, I think. Okay, we have this many envelopes and that many people. So, again, the odds are good. Will you be the keeper of envelopes? So, I'm going to do this quickly. Just come up and select one of these. There are various amounts. Some of them have three digits, some of them have two digits. So, I say good luck to all of you here. And we'll, we'll get through this quickly. You can't tell me to mix them up because there's only like six of them in here. Okay, the first ticket, uh, 835 835-9121. Come up and select an envelope. 835-9121. Did he leave or she leave? Going once, going twice.
Come on up. Somebody come and try this AR thing. And did you guys scan for our app? You can leave it going out the door. Take a quick scan of the app. Somebody come put these glasses on. He promises you a good time. Thank you. 